Well, welcome back to another episode of Practical Youth Ministry Tips. As you can see, I'm not by myself today. I have got my friend Josh Arana on the other side of the, the screen there. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing well, Eric. How are you? I am doing so well. So I'm your host, Eric with a K, and I'm just thrilled that you are joining us today. Today's topic is going to be about camp. And uh, Josh and I just want to talk a little bit about like how we know each other, what your history is uh, in ministry and where you're at today and all that stuff. So talk a little bit about what you've done in ministry, how you got into it, and uh, and kind of moving forward to where you're at today. Absolutely. I started in ministry when I was 18 years old, just got back from a year long uh, a year long missions trip, traveling to Thailand and Vietnam and came back and, uh, the kids pastor at the church that I grew up in, she needed a, um, an assistant basically asked me two weeks after I came back from this mission trip, asked me if I would be her assistant. And I said, yes, cause I didn't have a job. I didn't know what that would mean. And so I did everything from prepping crafts for kids ministry, prepping uh, crafts, doing, uh, prepping leaders, rosters, whatever it is that she needed me to do, uh, make copies, uh, make, you know, deliver things and occasionally get her coffee if she needed it. Um, but then, uh, eventually through that, I uh, did that pretty for a little while, then eventually kind of like moved up the ranks and oversaw the Wednesday night program for kids ministry for a couple of years. And they, then they had me, they kind of grew from that. And they had me help start up the kids ministry at their first uh, like satellite campus that they held. I got to create a kids ministry from the ground up, bring the DNA from like the, the, the big campus over to the smaller campus, and then got to oversee the fifth and sixth grade ministry. And eventually uh, kind of graduating and promoting over to youth ministry. I started youth ministry. Oh, I want to say 2000, 2013, 2014 um, was around the time that I started getting into youth ministry, which is where I officially became a youth pastor and uh, did that for a couple of years at the same church. Um, and then I felt like God was calling me uh, um, away from that. You know, the, my season at that church was done and God was calling me to another church. Um, and this uh, this other church was not too far from my home church, um, but they needed a youth pastor. I had a couple of friends who were attending this church and it was strictly middle school, high school ministry. And so I went, yes, I, I went over there and interviewed and became their youth pastor uh, for several years, I want to say for like four or five years, I was the youth pastor, um, and then was asked and promoted to being the family pastor at one of the campuses of this church in, uh, not too far from my home. And, uh, and I think this is actually around the time that Eric and I, we met because I was the family pastor, next gen pastor, family pastor, um, at one of our satellite campuses, one of our campuses. And Eric came in to being the, executive pastor executive director pastor of all the youth ministry i'm gonna get that i'm gonna get that wrong of all the youth That's, ministry. it's so, close enough sounds good and uh <laughs> of what i did my role at the other campus what i did was overseeing kids youth young adult ministry i uh in uh, to many degree a lot of what i did fell under eric's umbrella and eric's influence and uh Eric was in a way, in many ways, he was like a direct report. I had the campus pastor was my, my boss. And then I also had like uh, a lot of influence that came from, that came from Eric. So this, that was around the time Eric, was it 2019? I want to say. Yeah. 2019. 2019. That's when Eric and I met. And so Eric was sort of like the boss, the next gen boss at uh, the main campus. Oh, I don't like using that, but that essentially what it was. Central. Yeah. Whatever it is. <laughs> And, uh, and so, yeah, a lot of what Eric would plan for the rest of the campuses, he would kind of delegate and assimilate to the rest of us. And we would, we would implement that respect, respectfully in, in our own, uh, in our own campuses. And so I've been involved in ministry. Uh, yeah. Since I was 18 full-time ministry, it was 18. And so it's been 20, 20, 30, I mean, a, a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of math there. Like 16 years I've been, I was involved in, um, in ministry in mostly kids, youth, young adult type of ministry. Right now I am not currently in ministry. I started a business earlier this year in social media marketing in managing and, uh, 
And so that's sort of where I was sensing earlier in the year that, that the Lord was uh, leading me to do. And so I am in the middle of that right now. Um, and so uh, my wife and I, we met in ministry. We actually met in the church that we grew up in. And, and uh, so she was with me through when I became a pastor is the same year that she and I got married. And so she was with me as we kind of grew up, you know, being involved in, in youth ministry. And so, uh, yeah, I love, I love ministry and I love people who are involved in ministry and so grateful for Eric and his influence and what he brought over and helping me be a better pastor at the time when I was, uh, leading youth ministry. So I'm really happy and excited to be joining in on this conversation, Eric. Thanks so much for, for asking me. I think this is a really important topic for youth pastors to, start having and have a really good dialogue around camp and what it means in the life of a youth group. So thanks for having me, man. Well, absolutely. You know, I, I, I love camp. I grew up going to camp and then I served at a camp in, in, uh, upstate New York for seven years, all high school and college and actually was offered the director position, but I'd already taken a position, uh, as a youth pastor straight out of college. So, um, I, but I knew that, I would always have camp as part of what I did because it's so incredibly valuable, right? And in ministry, if you know, I think most people in ministry, in youth ministry, have had some sort of camp involvement, and you get that kind of getting away. You know, we call sometimes we call a retreat, particularly like a weekend retreat. We're retreating from the things that we're doing and, and getting away and having this opportunity to to have a totally different schedule to have more focused time on friendships and 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 on Jesus and and fun that we don't typically do right you just kind of go through normal life when you're at home and so there's I, I find such high value in camp and there there's a couple of things I wanted to talk today about uh, regarding this Josh and at the end we're gonna talk a little bit about what kind of opportunities could uh, could could there be for someone in a church right now, and maybe possibly even working with you? Because hey, we're all using social media, trying to grow our ministries, and I know that you have experience helping ministries grow as a result of using social media. So we'll, we'll come back to that towards the end. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. I want to talk a little bit more about that, but let's let's jump into the conversation about camp. First of all, Josh, wh- for you, why? Why camp? Why retreat? Why why get why go do that? I think many of it is what you've already said, Eric. It's the opportunity to cultivate, create experiences that probably young people would not have in their normal daily lives um, because of the various things that they're distracted with. And so what you do is with the retreat, you basically retreat from your normal day-to-day life. I love that. Your normal responsibilities, your normal whatever expectations of yourself or what other people have of you, and to be able to spend hopefully significant amount of time with God. Yes, we will probably talk about it here. The camps are always packed with a lot of fun things, and you make you know you make friends and you have new experiences. But I think at the core behind what camps should be about is creating intentional conversations and intentional times um, and experiences that young people can have with with God. And I think that that's one of the one of the key things that takes place. One of the things that I think is really really important. It probably looks different with every church or you know in in, in different locations and what that what that could mean. You know, I've been part of camps where people obviously go up to the mountains or they go out to a desert or they go, go out to the beach. And I've also been part of camps where people do that at the same church that they worship on a Sunday morning, but they just like change out an entire room and it looks completely different. And that's what they're able to do. I think the intention behind it is creating experiences that young people can have with God that would hopefully be a catalyst to uh, a changed life. This would be the start of something different in their lives, that they would continue living their lives. They they would live their lives differently because of what they experienced at camp. Yes, for for kids and young people who accepted Christ for the very first time, but even those who just needed a kind of like a reigniting of their faith, that their lives would just be completely different post-camp because of what took place at camp. So I think it's an incredibly important conversation that we need to have uh, with youth pastors and youth leaders uh, around why camps should be part of the equation in your youth group. Yeah, totally. It it just shifts kind of your normal, like you, you have youth group, you do, you, whether it's like Sunday morning or it's a midweek or, or whatever that looks like, 
you can do that all year long. And I, I always say, I always say that those are so valuable. I've read for the last 10 years is the, is the weekly sermon dead, you know, and I, I, I don't think that'll ever be the case per se, because I, even though most people go, man, I can't remember what the pastor talked about last weekend, right? But in the moment, you're gaining something and you're learning something and you're experiencing something. And, and I equate that kind of like growing up uh, when my, my parents raising me up as a kid, my mom would make meals. I don't remember most of the meals. Now, I, I do remember we ate a lot of hamburger helper because it was cheap. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, you know, and, and some spaghetti or whatever. But there wasn't a lot of variety. But I, I don't remember, you know, what we ate all the time. But what I do know is that I, if I hadn't eaten all of those meals that aren't particularly memorable, I wouldn't be alive, right? And so I think the same thing with, with the, the messages that we give they they spiritually feed us and build us and help us to grow, right? And so sometimes there are some there are some meals when my mom would make steak, I remember those meals, right? Or when we would go out to Ryan's after church on Sunday, Ryan's Steakhouse, which was like a buffet, cheap buffet type of place, um, but they they had all you could eat prime rib and and pork chops or something like that. It was just like, mm, you know, and. But like, so those things stick out. There's a few meals that my mom would make that would stick out and, and uh, sometimes special occasions like birthdays and whatever. Uh, I certainly remember our Christmas meals because we're a Norwegian family. We have, we have Riesenskrinskret, which is an, or Norwegian uh, Christmas, like a rice, Riesenskrinskret. Um, but Gret was like this, like a rice pudding type of thing. But so anyhow, I remember some of them, but I think, Camp is kind of like that. There are a few like services that you'll do on a regular uh, uh, week or weekend where the message just hits in a certain way and students remember that day or the worship was just a certain way and the song part of worship. But a lot of times the meal that they remember is that getting away on a retreat. And sometimes it's like shorter day trips or whatever, but those are those moments that I think that really, you, you look back and go, I grew from all of it, but that was a pivotal moment for me. Um, now, one of the things we want to talk today about, because they're kind of two, they're probably not the only two. Well, actually, we three, we, you, you kind of mentioned them, but some different ways to do camp. And uh, one where you go to a camp that runs everything for you. All you do is show up. The second one is where you plan, you kind of rent out a camp and you go do everything, but you just have, you're renting the space and the rooms and all of that. And then you reference doing a, a retreat, a camp on your own campus. Um, so maybe we'll touch a little bit on that one, but talk, talk a little bit about the advantages to the different ones. Sure. Let me touch on first the, the, the programmed camp, the one that you're paying for that everybody is all done for you. Essentially, you just got to get the kids up there safely keep the kids safe and behave as much as you possibly can and then get them back home. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to that. Obviously what I just mentioned, you basically just show up and you're there to build relationships with your kids. I, I mean, you don't have to worry about very much except for your own kids, um, taking care of your kids, making sure they're not getting in trouble and just having a blast with them, enjoying, um, enjoying the camp with him. I, I also want to mention a, a few of the cons, if that's okay, Eric, just, yeah. just as they are coming up. I think that there's a lot of pros with um, programmed camps um, that, that, you know, obviously everything gets done for you. You don't have to worry about a lot of stuff, um, you know, uh, but there is, there could be a downside to some of this, depending on, you know, kind of where you are in ministry, how busy you are. Um, but that, you know, you could with sometimes camps, these types of camps can provide a, a speaker that doesn't always 
uh, line up theologically where you or your church is. And so sometimes I'll bring up a topic or they'll say something during the message that can probably cause more issues and cause more damage than help. And that will cause a lot of like conversations to take place. doesn't happen a lot. In my experience, it didn't happen a ton. And when it did happen, there were manageable conversations that we had. It wasn't like it was crazy. You know, we went to, we went to camps that we trusted their leadership and, but you know, there'd be, you know, it's, they're going to, the intention is to reach, you know, all the denominations as much as they can. And so, you know, they might bring a speaker that you don't agree with theologically. Typically, typically these types of camps are also extremely expensive because they provide a lot of fun and a lot of activities uh, for the kids. And so the cost could typically be higher than what you are normally paying for, but you are probably most likely paying for really quality programming in the chapel. And you're probably paying for really um, advanced and really uh, great activities for kids when they're, when they're hanging out that those are some advantages of that. Um, the other, the other camp types of camp that you do is like basically the do it yourself. The pros to that is you basically uh, you have costs that's a l typically lower. You're just paying for um, uh, the the facilities, like you said, for the meals, um, and then sometimes for some of the activities. Though they are typically not offered as much as uh, you know a program camp, um, so the cost goes down a little bit, and then you can have some control in you know the the messaging that goes out there. If your um, church is strict in certain theological. Uh, principles or values or more, you know, then then you can kind of stick and and you know what's going to be taught because it's typically uh, a pastor or a speaker that you are going to be providing, whether if it's you you or somebody else that you're going to approve. You you have control that you have control a little bit more control of, um, you know the the environment and the and the space. I also think that planning your own camp provides a little bit more of uh, opportunity for you to delegate some things to your team and to kind of see some members of your team, um, you know, act out a little bit more in leadership roles. If you delegate well, there are pe certain people in your team that can handle. Um, certain tasks in camp. And that's kind of fun to see what people are, are able to do. You as a pastor are probably going to be super busy with stuff like this. And so the relationship, you probably won't have as much time to build a relationship with your students as you would in a programmed camp that's done for you. So that's something that you're going to have to kind of weigh out. And then, yeah, like you meant, like, like we talked about having a camp done at the church, I probably would fall a little bit more on the you planning out the camp yourself, but there it's a little, I would say that this, you know, if you're doing a camp at your church, that is completely, that can't not completely, but that could be pretty much stripped down. You don't probably have to have all the bells and whistles and stuff. You, you most likely you, what you're running on is the relationships that you've already built with your students. And so the fun times that you can have with your students um, doing it there, I think that those can be, um, you know, the cost is significantly lower because you're not paying for a price. At least I hope your church wouldn't charge you to hold the camp at your own facility. Uh, so you probably would be paying for mostly meals and any activities you want the kids to do. Um, and so the cost would be super low uh, relationships. It could be hit and miss on you, whether you are able to build relationships with your students, because you're probably running around planning things, um, planning things out. And so uh, you didn't really ask me this, Eric, but uh, I know you and I have had so many conversations about camps and I was actually pushing even in our in our last couple months of working together at our last church I was actually really pushing for us to have our own do our own camp and I know that that was kind of like I'm not sure that we were set up to do that um but I would have loved to have been able to have planned our own camp I do that not because I I say that not because I'm a sucker for more work because it is a lot of work um but I think that there, for me, probably, I, I think that I see a little bit more value in being able to uh, see your team kind of rise up to the occasion, um, being able to provide something for your for your students that you know that, hey, us, our church, our team, we're, we're able to provide this. But I say that to also say that it does come with a cost and it is a very busy season. It is a lot of work, a lot of sleepless nights getting ready for that campus. So it's not, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. Um, so I do see advantages of going to a program camp. I, I, I kind of see it, Eric, it, you know, it kind you kind of have to just see where you're at in, in the season in life. If you're trying to ask yourself, should I take my kids to a program camp or should I do it myself? I mean, personally, you've got to just figure out if, if you're in a spot where 
all you're focusing on is, is student ministry. All you're focusing on is middle school and high school students. Um, maybe you have room, maybe you have the bandwidth to be able to run your own camp and do your own thing. Um, but maybe you're not in that spot and maybe you're not only doing youth ministry, you're also taking care of social media or facilities or greeters or whatever else it is that you also have to handle. It's outside of your job description or what you signed up to do. Maybe taking your kids to a program camp where everything is pretty much done for you and you focus on making sure that your kids are having a great time and building relationships. I think there's it's valid as well. I don't think one diminishes the other. I think both can provide pros and cons to the life of your youth group. I think what you have to look at is, okay, this is these are the cards that were dealt to me. These are the decisions that we made. We're here at camp. Okay, what are we going to do with the time that God has allowed us to experience, whether it is that you go to a program camp or whether you're doing it on your own? How are you going to use the time most effectively to honor God and then to help draw young people to be closer to him? Yeah, dude, that that's so good, Josh. I, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on on on, on all of that stuff because I, I I I see value in all of them, and I can't remember where I was leaning when we were talking uh, towards the end there. But uh, if I was like, well, the paid camp, I think probably looking at the all inclusive because of our capacity of people at the time, uh, because that is that is the the. Uh, um, the exchange, right? Like you get to form the camp the way you want it to be. You know your students and you can do the things. You can do the songs that you know they love and add a couple of extra ones that, th that they're going to grab onto that goes on into like your regular services and whatever. But you you can do the games that you want and you can. You can, you can get leaders involved. I think too, getting some people that aren't regularly involved in your youth ministry, plugging them into a camp like that where like, let's say you just know somebody who's really good at games, but they haven't done youth ministry or they aren't part of your youth ministry at the time. Hey, would you be willing to come and do program with us and, and run the games for the weekend? That's, that's your only job. That's all I want you to do. Could it, it is a potential place for them to find this love for the ministry and bring them in, but just giving them a piece of a weekend that that's their job. That's their responsibility. They don't have to worry about anything else. Uh, I think opens a door for future uh, relationship and and ministry serving together. The the big thing for me on camps that you're that are pre-programmed for you is your leaders, you and your leaders. What you do is you just hang with your students. That's all. That's that's your job. You don't have to worry about anything else. And I love that piece. Um, I did really enjoy when we did. You know, we kind of stole it from Mariners from Josh Griffin Camp Us. Like it was camp on our campus. Um, it was super cheap. And I think, I don't know, what do we charge? Like 35 bucks or something like that. Just coming out of COVID. And uh, was we, we were able to make it really cheap. And that was a huge deal because we knew a lot of people that the previous year and a half was tough. Um, and I think it's still a viable option today and, and and into the future because you can make it really cheap and you can use your stuff. And it's not going to be as big, but we had we borrowed some bubble soccer uh, from a church and we had the bazooka balls that, that you had purchased years prior. And um, we, so we did a bunch of those things, but uh, we were able to really cater. We used our own worship team. Uh, we used our own people for speaking and, and running the games and all that stuff. So that was... That was a cool opportunity. Again, it's the same as running your own camp where you are doing all of the pieces, but because you're not paying for the camp's food or you're not paying for the facilities, you can do it so much cheaper. And that's a you know, maximum amount of students that you can impact. I think there, there's, some, there's some really great advantages to that. Uh, so... Okay, so let's let's talk about let's let's focus a little bit more on that running your own camp, uh, because we we know when you go to a camp, the program is set for you, you dive in. As a guy who was working for a, a denomination for a regional headquarters for ten years, I would gather for every I I ran retreats and camps and conferences for our youth ministries for about a hundred churches, and I would get five or five or six youth pastors from different churches together to help plan one of the camps. 
So each camp had a different team of youth pastors. And so there was kind of a combo where they got involved with all of the planning, the themes, and, and they each had pieces. And then other churches were able to come and just, just plug in. But there was already relationship with all of those people as well. Um, so I have a great love for programming. I love doing that. Um, but talk a little bit about some of the elements when you're running your own camp. What are some of the important elements that you think should you should make always make sure that you add to a retreat? I think obviously you 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 could stick with the kind of the normal elements that uh, you know a program camp can have. Obviously, you stick with your chapels. You need to have your chapels. You need to have time for somebody to be able to teach God's word to the students. You want to have incredible. I mean, if there's ever a time to bring out the awesome games it is at camp it has to be at camp games that you're going to introduce to your youth group for the rest of the school year they need to be introduced at camp i think um in traditions whatever um but i also think that you can add some personal touches to to camps yes have your normal like you know big worship uh, uh um chapels I like to also provide opportunities for people to kind of build relationships with each other. So one thing we would do typically is we would have our student team, uh, student leaders that were typically juniors and seniors um, in high school. And they were a set of maybe like 12 to 20 uh, student leaders that we had, had already been discipling for maybe six months up to whenever you're having your camp. We had already been discipling them for about six months. They would typically be the ones who would be leading the morning chapel. So if you're having a Friday to Sunday uh, uh, camp, Friday night chapel, Saturday night chapel, that's the big, that is the big production chapel stuff on the screens you know uh, inflatable balls going everywhere confetti everywhere i mean like yeah, that's a, that's a big thing the morning chapels were a little bit more acoustic driven and a little bit more stripped down in the sense of like they weren't all the production value we still had a speaker but it was all led by students so our worship team was all students um the speaking typically was done with students unless they had a little bit of like a meltdown and they couldn't do it. Then we would probably have like a student and a leader um, do it. And so that was really fun because this was a way for the students to kind of give back and to teach their peers and um, other students. But then we would provide opportunities like a late night activity or a late night experience for them. Something fun. We would do like maybe we, if we hired a DJ or did silent disco or something. And that was just something that was really fun. Kids can come dress in their pajamas or whatever. And then we'd have like donuts or pizza, exactly. Donuts or pizza and something fun that they could do. That was typically Friday night. We would do like an early morning hike and worship, whether it was Saturday or Sunday morning, be up by like 4.30 or five and do like a hike somewhere close to the camp. Um, <laughs> again, whoever could. <laughs> I I wasn't at that camp, 4.30 no. or five. <laughs> No, I and the thing is, the other if I was running my own camp, I typically wasn't sleeping at all. So, you know, we were always cleaning things and getting things ready for the next day. And then it was like, oh, it's four in the morning. We're going to do that hike in about an hour. And so we would just go do the hike. Um, and so we would have an early morning hike and, and students who did it, they, they, there was a good group of students that would be part of that. Um, and then we also did this thing at our at our camps. This is a tradition that a friend of mine started in my other church. We would have these like manila envelopes taped on the side of the chapel and every envelope was the name of a student and a leader. So we would have, I mean, so many, I mean, just so everybody had an envelope and I had a leader who couldn't go to camp with us, had some mobility um, struggle, had some mobil mobility issues, but really wanted to get back. And so I had her, um, I would have somebody like design every, every envelope was created specifically for that person. And so it was designed. Um, and then we would have a little table that have these post-it notes and these cards, and you could write a message to, to somebody at the camp and just drop it off. And you would have all weekend to do it. And then Sunday, one of the last things we did is you went and you got your envelope and you could read all the notes that you got all weekend long as you travel back down camp from, from, you know, as you're traveling back home, you know, sometimes a little pro tip for you, if you did this, you know, have your leaders go through and see if there's any kids that have um, any manila envelopes that were empty, then they would write notes and they would stuff them in there so that everybody had at least four or five notes from people. And so we would do different touches, things like that. Uh, we would also provide breakout groups. So if I was doing a topic on, if the whole weekend was 
we did a we did a camp that was Instagram themed, my Instagram life or Instagram life or something like that. This is you know 2014 where when the idea was somewhat fresh. Um, and so we would have breakout groups on Saturday afternoon. We'd have like a morning chapel and one was breakfast, morning chapel, and then we'd have breakout groups right after um the morning chapel. And it's you know, there were there were sessions essentially that the leaders so would like do. seminars type of thing, like right? seminars, correct. Yeah. There were like 35 to 40 minute seminars. Um, and I, we tried to make the topics of these to fit in the theme of the camp. And so these were, these were led by the students. They all, I mean, by the, by the leaders, uh, the student leaders. And so this all had to be approved by me, So they would submit their topic. They would submit their notes to me, any activity that they were doing their breakout all had to be approved by me just to make sure that everybody was lined up theologically. And we would find, you know, breakout breakouts throughout the camp. And so students would be able to sort of like a VBS type of thing. They would go to one breakout they'd be there for 30 35 minutes and then they would go to another breakout and they can pick up to up to two and then it would be by that point lunch and then they had their free time and so those are like little touches that we were able to do like the leaders being able to reinforce try to reinforce relationship with our leaders our leaders are teaching breakouts student leaders are are investing into into the camp or providing experiences uh you know late night early morning that our kids can be part of to kind of learn what it looks like to have an early morning devotional and worship Jesus and then have clean fun you know wholesome fun in the evenings you know with the rest of their friends we try to kind of provide those experiences a little touches of personal uh, personal touches throughout throughout um our weekend yeah that's awesome i i i love the the encouragement card idea i I've, I've seen that and done that at a couple of camps over the years and and I I love that you brought it up because I think that that is one of those pieces that we don't really know typically the impact that those cards have. Um, but I have heard from parents in the past from when we've done that. My son has all the cards he got from the camp taped around his mirror in his bedroom. Like those kind of things like just writing notes of encouragement and dropping it in, making sure your volunteers are looking at that, looking into each of them and writing to the ones that are in their cabins, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, that's a that's a great piece. I think too, in the afternoons, sometimes like you, you open up full free time for the whole afternoon. Sometimes there's like organized, uh, you know, whether it's a football game or we're doing team competitions, um, you know, and it's like crab walk, competitions or whatever it is right so you, you or the bubble soccer like we did and those kind of things where you can you can really um, maximize like you said some of those games that, that you have now I will say speaking of games like when you're talking about Friday night and Saturday night the the screen games and the confetti and all that stuff I have I like download youth ministries is a great place to find uh, fantastic screen games I also recently discovered YM 360. They have these premium. They have they have like your typical kind of like PowerPoint esque uh, games, screen games. But they also have what they call the premium games, and I've been looking at those. And dude, there's some really. I'll, I'll put a link in the description uh, to both of those uh, as well. There's another one, CrowdControlGames.com. They they put together some fantastic screen games. Some that are like. There, there's one, there, they have several games that are like voice activated. So like you have half the room go against the other half the room. And so when the when voices are made, it causes some, some character on the screen to do something. And then play Pong and there's a car race and they have a few others that are just fantastic um, that they put out. So I'll put all the links to that in, in, the, uh, in the description below. Talk a little bit about with all of those elements... And I know, I know like a lot of that doing your own camp can sometimes seem like that's, that's great for your, you larger churches, but what about for us smaller churches? I believe, and, and you can respond to this too, Josh, I believe that you can, you can still do a camp for your own group if you have 10 to 20 students. Um, because, and it's, it's not, it may not be the all of the massive things and that maybe is not what your group is about you know your own group and you know what would work um and sometimes take you know maybe there's an extra thing like i've i've really enjoyed the last few years the uh uh air uh was it arrow tag basically it's a bow and arrow but it looks like a giant marshmallow at the end of the bow and you 
and, and you're shooting at each other. Like that's been a really fun element. We, we rented one of those out, had a guy come out for an event we did with our church uh, this summer uh, or this spring. And uh, you can do those kind of things at camp, even, even when you have a handful of students. And sometimes maybe those are going to be a little more subdued. Maybe they're not. It's, I think every ministry really takes on the flavor of the personality of the leader of the group, right? So maybe you're more of an outdoorsy person and you're doing whitewater rafting and hiking and climbing and all of that stuff. And you're mixing in retreats, uh, excuse me, messages and, and that kind of thing. And you have the small group experiences because that's what all of that is because your group is small. Those are awesome. I'm coaching a church through that right now that, that is a smaller church. Uh, it has a smaller youth ministry. And we're looking at how do, we, how do we do these things with the size of group that we have. Um, but talk a little bit, Josh, uh, about the planning part for this. Do you have, and I know we didn't talk about this piece ahead of time, do you have like a template? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you work off of something? What are some things that you need to do to pl- when you're planning? Because I know in your last role when we were working together, you were constantly coming to me for uh, you needing stuff to, for promotion, right? So talk a little bit about the planning side of the things. So um, yes, if you're planning your own camp, it's going to be, you, you've got to start early and you've got to start, you got to figure out when you're going to have your camp, obviously, and then kind of work your way back. I tell people you're going to want to give yourself four to five months at least of planning time before you're even promoting the event. So I like to tell people you want to give yourself two months or so to, to promote um, your camp effectively. People can save money, can prepare, especially if you're going to be promoting through the holidays. Um, th- this is a perfect Christmas gift, in my opinion. If parents did this the right way, um, this is a perfect way for people to, this is a perfect gift. You want to go to camp? We're going to give it to you as a, as a gift for Christmas. I think it's perfect, but people need to plan to do that. So if you're having your camp, um, in February, in January, February, you're going to want to start promoting at least in November, December, and then you're going to want to work yourself four or five months before that. So you were talking about wanting to start to plan something like in March or April, um, to really understand like what you're going to do so that you're promoting exactly what's going to be offered at camp. One of the things that drove me crazy is when people will promote camps, but they have no idea what they're going to do at camps. So they didn't know what they were promoting because they hadn't, they hadn't even planned out the camp. It drove me nuts and I could not stand it. I could not stand it. So it's almost like, what am I paying for? What are we involved in? So you have to have all those answers done before you're even promoting the camp. That's my opinion. Other people can find me on that, but that's my opinion. (laughs) Gotta have that thing planned. So if you're planning out logistics of your camp, I always start with the schedule. What do you want your schedule to look like? Friday, what are you going to do Friday? What are you going to do Saturday? What are you going to do, do Sunday? And then you're going to figure out who can plan what within within those within those days. Okay, Friday, you have your chapel. You have dinner. Um, chapel, dinner, your late night experience. No, registration. Registration, you have uh, chapel, dinner, and late night experience. Okay, who can be in charge of those four things? Okay, I have my friend uh, Jenny who can be in charge of registration. I still need to talk with her. She's going to be in charge of it, but I'm going to talk with her about doing this. I have my friend Taylor who's a worship leader, but he's also going to be in charge of chapel. Well, I'm going to give him direction of what's expected of him. I have my friend Carlos who's going to be in charge of the late night experience. Um, And so I'm going to give him all the instructions of what he needs to plan out his stuff for the late night experience, whether it's booking a DJ or whether it's getting the silent disco stuff, whatever it is, he needs to be in charge of that. I'm going to talk to my friend Bree, who's going to take pictures during uh, during dinner and make sure that there are specific pictures that we are trying to get throughout the night, but also specifically at dinner if I wanted them. So I had to kind of think through all those things. Once I got Friday kind of figured out, did the same thing with Saturday. And Saturday's a beast in itself because it's an entire day of stuff. So who can plan out? The same thing with Sunday. Um, what's going to happen one year we did this thing where we did really special pictures for a camp and we wanted them to be printed by the time the kids got out, um, got dropped up, got picked up by their parents at church on Sunday. So there was a lot of logistics that needed to happen. Somebody had to take all the pictures, our photographer had to take all the pictures and then she had to upload them to Dropbox and she left the camp after we all left the camp so that then it would send, then send an email to somebody who's back at the church, who's imprinting all the stuff to be able to get all the uh, 
uh, information or all everything printed in time for parents to pick up. It was just such a logistical thing. So if you're planning your logistics, I always start with the schedule. What is it you want to get done and who can get done? Figure out what it is that you have to do as the pastor, as the director. What is it that you have to do um, that are the non-negotiables? You have to handle certain things. And then what are the other things you can delegate to other people in your team and have them kind of run with it, trust them with it. Um, that, that would be the logistics. That's a simple version. I would also say with download youth ministry, they have provided, at least I haven't looked in the last year or so, but I know that it's still there. I'm confident it's still there. They have provided a lot of resources in planning your own camp or even planning your own event. If you're looking at it, uh, if you look at some of the researches for planning an all-nighter, a lot of those plans and ideas are transferable for, for a camp. So yeah. I would look at what resources are out there, what checklists are out there and kind of adopt to those checklists and then change them up accordingly to your own, um, you know, to your, to your church and to how you work and the kind of team that you have. That would be the logistics side. I also say that you need to plan out the spiritual side of, of things. You need to plan out the speaking the worship songs, I think you need to be intentional about the types of worship songs that kids are going to be singing that reinforce the message that they are going to be hearing from the chapel speaker, what the breakout sessions are going to look like, uh, what the devotionals are going to be, are going to look like. I, I didn't mention this. There was also, I forgot to mention that there was also a set time that students had their own personal devotional with God. And so there was a guided reading where they would read through a Psalm and they had to read the Psalm. And then there were questions. All that has to be planned out and prayed through uh, before you are up at camp. And so all that takes months of planning and preparation. And so whatever the spiritual side of it is, it always, for me, started off with whatever the key verse is for the weekend. The goal of what we want kids to walk away with is this verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Um, that's what we want our kids to walk away with. Okay, so then how do we, how can we frame up the theme around this verse? How do we frame up the breakup session around this verse or around this theme? How do we pick songs that are based off of this theme? Um, again, it takes months of preparation, but my encouragement is that you would, that you start early um, and figure out how you can delegate things to other people. Yeah, that's so, so good. Of information, I'm sorry. No, no, no. And and what's great is we want to give you, uh, our our viewers today and our listeners today, a, actually a free download that Josh and I have worked on together that has some of those elements, the, the kind of a, a, a mapped out schedule and then a ch timeline with some checklist stuff. We want to give you that free. That, that'll be in the links below. So feel free to click the link when you're done watching this and get that free download uh, on on kind of running your own camp. I think that'll be really helpful for you. Josh, talk about this um, when thinking about pricing camp. So if you're doing your own camp, you know, do you, do you use, what do you, what do you use budget for? Do you use your budget? What about leaders? Do, do you, are you charging leaders or how do you pay for your leaders? That kind of thing. Do, do you add it in to the, all of that? Uh, I, I think, well, this is not for me. This never was the moneymaker. This event never made the youth group any money. In fact, I think we lost um, a, a portion of our budget. I, we always knew every fiscal year going into it that a portion of the budget, I don't want to throw out like crazy numbers, but a portion of our budget would go towards camps and retreats. That's how important it was to us and to the leadership. The leadership, when I was running camps, um, they, they they trusted they trusted us to teach the gospel to kids so they had to trust us with money as well and so they trusted that the way that we were spending the money was going to be effective use of it uh for for the kids and so we never made money off of this don't i hate also i've heard that the people like trying to overcharge that they can make some money this to me never made any money there's other things that you could do that could you could try to make money this is you you've got budget if you have budgeted money we I, I've worked in churches where they there was a budget set aside for the youth group to use for the entire fiscal year, and and a portion I would decide of the portion of that to be towards winter camp and summer camp. And so again, it goes back to if I if I'm planning it and I know which camp I'm going to, I'm going to look at what is the bare minimum that they're charging me. I looked up early this morning. Um, I looked up a camp that I that I went to um, not too far from where I live. Uh, they're charging right now for two nights and five meals. They're charging uh, the church one hundred and nineteen dollars per student or per individual. One hundred nineteen. Then I think through okay, what the what is the transportation going to be? Uh, I tried to I tried to divide the total cost of the transportation for for round trip. So whatever I'm paying for, if I'm paying for buses, 
paying for vans, whatever it is, I try to do the math and I divide it by, by students who are traveling. Then I add that cost into, into the student cost. And then I also add, yes, I do add a portion of the leader cost built into the student registration. I don't know how you feel about this, Eric, personally. I know we've talked a little bit about this. There was another youth leader that we talked to that completely disagreed with me on this. And frankly, I didn't care what he thought. That's how I did it. Um, it makes sense to me. Um, I never, I've, I, I never charged my leaders for anything. I never did. I never, it didn't make sense to me. I'm not judging on anybody else who does that. And I get that people have small budgets and they can't always work in this way. So this is not a judgment call at all. If you don't do it this way to me, it didn't make sense for a leader who is going to be away from their family, who is going to be sleeping in a cabin, not even probably barely sleeping in a cabin. Um, <laughs> And I'm thinking of the of the boy side, right? Like being in a cabin with 10 to 12 boys, um, you're not going to get a lot of sleep. You're probably going to get sick. You're probably going to lose your voice. You're probably going to get sick and then bring it home, bring it into your house because you got to go to work the next day. I typically took the next Monday off to recover from being gone from all week. My leaders didn't do that. They had to go to work the next Monday. So it didn't, it didn't ever make sense to me that I would charge my leaders to go to camp when I needed them to be there. But it did make sense to me to build it into the cost of the students. And it wasn't a lot. I'm thinking like, you know, if you have 10 to 12, you know, 10, 10 students, you know, and you divide that, you, div you, you divide the leader cost by 10 students. It's not actually not a terrible price to add on to, um, to the students, uh, to the students registration fee. And I was always upfront and honest with parents. Even I would provide an information packet for parents and it was plain right there. How much does this cost? And how much and where is the money going towards? And I would have it written out right there. Okay, this is how much is the campus charging us. This is how much it is for transportation. This is how much for your leaders, because these your leaders are gonna be the ones who are gonna be dealing with your kids, not me. I was I hardly <laughs> ever was I didn't even be I would I hardly ever was in the same cabin as students if I was planning my own camp because I knew that it was important for leaders to be in there. And so it 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 just made sense to me and how I did it. And I and I never really kind of I never faced any issue with that. Um, but that's sort of how I saw it. And so when you do that, when I did the math, even this morning with this camp that I was looking at, two nights, five meals, transportation, leader costs, it was costing around $194 uh, for the weekend for the kids. And that's just that's just the base. Um, something else I would do with the registration is I would I would give incentives. I try to do the incentives. I know Eric was really big on this as well. Um, you know, if you register by this date, this would be your pro this would be your cost, the 194. If you waited a, a month later, then the price would increase uh, another 20 to 30 bucks. And then the price would increase again right before camp, another 20 to 30 bucks. Um, so essentially you could save $60. Forty to sixty dollars if you registered early, and you if even if you just put in a deposit, a portion of the of the fee early, then you would you would be locked in for that price. To me, that was helpful because that allowed that forced people to register early, reasonably early. I wasn't getting all these last minute registrations, so we it allowed us to plan out the camp as well as possible. Um, and then it kind of I think was a little bit fair. Yes, there was some extra money. But again, I was always honest with people. I, I even one year because parents did want to know like how much we spent. I had a spreadsheet of how much money the, the youth group actually lost in putting on this camp. I can't, I don't even remember then the amount that, that we lost, but it was honest. Like, yeah, even though we're adding to the registration, the incentive was we want you to register early. So it locks in your price. Um, we do that for a variety of reasons, but yes, like I said, it's to plan out accordingly, but also to give a number to the camp, to the camp knew how many of us we're going up there. Guy, there was another reason. There was another reason. Oh, I mean, your contract. There's a bear, there's a minimum. Typically in contracts, there's a minimum of students you got to bring up there. You want to meet that minimum. Um, and so anyway, so all that kind of helped do that. So yeah, I will look at what the camp's going to charge you, what the transportation is going to look like. Any extra activities you're going to do that you know that you can plan out per kid. Silent disco was something that I knew per kid was going to be about 10 bucks. I would add that into the registration cost. Other stuff like crafty type things, paper, the stuff that we would do with the car. I mean, all the other stuff I had the youth group pay for it because it was just impossible to try to divide that per kid. Um, again, we didn't make money off of this. This is stuff to bless the kids. And so there was a lot of things that we as a ministry would purchase. And then we would have those materials for the rest of the, of the school year. 
Yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan too of never, there's like one instance where I charge volunteers for something. And that is when I've done some volunteer retreats, I will charge like $15. It probably cost me $50 or whatever, or 75, whatever it is. But I would charge $15 just so they have a little skin in the game because you know how it is when you give something for free and all of a sudden, hey, I can't make it today. Oh, well, that would have been great to know. We already bought all the food and you kind of, you're, you're stuck with it, whatever. But, um, which is why, I, again, so that I don't, I, I am totally with you. I never charge volunteers for anything that they're doing with youth ministry. Um, but I, I also like to have, feel, I made them feel guilty too, Eric. I would make them feel so bad if they, and I'm not kidding. Up front, from the beginning, I would tell them, you, I'm not going to charge you anything, but this is how much it would cost. It's going to cost your students, the students that you are discipling in your, in your small group. This is how much it's costing you. So if you, if you are not part of it, or if you leave without enough time for us to plan, you are essentially costing the church $120. You're costing students $120 or so, $190, whatever, dollars to, or so. Um, and I would make them feel so bad for doing that, that I hardly ever there. And, and it's true that the only time that somebody could not could not make it to a camp at the last minute was because their work couldn't, there was two reasons. One was their work would just wouldn't just backed out, wouldn't let them go. So it was outside of their control. The other person, they had a death in their family. And so they couldn't go at the last minute. Otherwise I never, I always had leaders show up to, to camps. They wanted to be there. They knew the value of them showing up. They knew that I wasn't going to be in the cabins with the, with the kids. They knew that I wasn't going to have time to build those relationships. And so they knew that they, it was their responsibility, their job to be there to build these relationships. And so we, you know, we had really good leaders that, that respected that, that realized that that was, that was. Yeah. And, and I was specifically more talking about like when I do a leader retreat, I make them pay a little bit, but I, I think I've only had one time where a leader last minute just didn't show up. And I, I was like, ah. but yeah, I, I think that's good. Okay. So we're, we're nearing the end of our time here, Josh. Um, Let's, let, I want to hit on one thing. What if you don't have a budget for camp or you don't have a budget, period? Do you have any creative ideas on how to help students get to camp and how to how to not just charge, well, it's going to be 700 bucks to go to camp or $1,000 to go to camp. And, and I know that happens some places and sometimes it's, you know, you go to a, you go to a huge camp that's expensive and you're, you're traveling far and so the, the cost of travel is expensive. And because renting buses, quite frankly, is not cheap, you know, so there's all those kind of pieces to it. So I know sometimes it just really is high. But what if you don't have a budget? What what would you do? Um, Man, I, I honestly first thing I would do is I would go to my I'd go to my direct report, um, my boss, my supervisor, and I would just kind of just be honest with them. I want to do this, but here's the money or not money, th th what I don't have to work with and kind of make sure that you have your pastor's support and is also sharing in the burden. Hopefully your pastor understands the importance of these camps and these retreats um, for kids. And so maybe you guys could share in the burden and come up with ideas together. But one of the, one of the campuses that we dealt with, Eric, it was not, I mean, my campus that I was at, you know, when I was doing the family pastor were very, very generous people. They knew, you know, especially the adults, older folks um, would write checks and would send kids up to campus. So we had uh, a, a, you know, a handful of people that would do that sponsor a student to go to camp. Yeah. Um, but there was another campus that we were working alongside that would, that were notorious for sending, just giving piles of money <laughs> to the youth group specifically to send kids to camp. Um, and one thing that I wish I tapped into more that I didn't was reaching out to the congregation more about the need of because I think especially the older folks in churches really, and I'm talking about the older, older folks that are, you know, up there. Um, they are, they, I think there's many that have a heart to seeing young generation, young people be part of the church, be part of um, their youth group. And I think that there's a lot of people that be willing to give probably not the full $194, but probably can give $100 towards it. I do think that people need time to be able to allow God to, to speak to them. And so I, it goes back to planning this out early. Um, 
go reaching out to people early months in advance and letting them know, Hey, we want to send kids to camp. Um, but we don't have the money to do it. Would you prayerfully consider, um, sponsoring a kid to go to camp? It costs this much, but any gift would be, um, would be appreciated. And I, I'm willing to bet that there would be several individuals who would be willing to sponsor a young person to go to camp. Um, I also would talk with your, with your pastor about what are some fundraising op opportunities that your youth group can be part of and, you know, selling, selling baked goods, um, uh, you know, after church, you know, doing chocolate fundraisers. I mean, the co coupon fundraiser, I mean, all kinds of, there's all kinds of stuff that you could do out there that have very little to no cost upfront for the church. Um, but I would talk with your pastor about what are some options that are available um, to make to make something like that happen. But really reach out to the people in your church and let people know, hey, there is there there are kids that want to go to camp, but we can't afford it right now. Would you consider what would you consider doing that? Those are yeah, some, that's uh, that's great. I think another episode would just be a fundraising ideas. I think could be really good. Okay, uh, Josh, I, you are having a baby. Your wife is having a baby soon, and you have to get to your birthing class. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, shortly, so we're gonna do what I'm right now calling the the fast fire five. I've done this with with everybody I've interviewed, but I just didn't give it a name till just now. The fast fire five. I like it. Um, by the way, side note: before we get to the fast fire five, need a speaker. Right now, I'm I'm working for myself and, and I'm available to come speak at camp. So if you need a speaker for camp, I'd love to come speak at your camp, whether it's a winter camp, fall camp, summer camp, whatever. And uh, second thing, oh yeah. Oh yeah, and, and a reminder, in the description below, we're gonna put the links to uh, the, those couple different websites I mentioned, as well as the free download that Josh and I have worked on together for uh, the planning and checklist and all of that stuff in a, in a weekend schedule. And now we're going to do the Fast Fire Five. And let me pull up the questions, Josh. Do, do, Is, there do. Like a theme song? Is there like a theme song? Go ahead. Sure. We're going to put a theme song in right here. Okay. Here we go. And I have not asked you these questions. You don't know what these questions are. Okay, we finished the podcast. You step outside. You find a winning lottery for ten million dollars. What do you do? Oh man, I pay off my debt first. Um, we are all we are we are in the journey of paying off debt, and uh, yeah, paying off debt. And uh, if I have any left over, just kidding. Um, <laughs> we we would pay off school loans mostly. That's what it is. It's school loans, and so pay off school loans. Uh, probably pay off my parents' house, um, and then buy buy my mother in law a house, buy my my siblings all homes, and then see where we're at there. Okay, so just to be clear, you don't find out who the owner is. You, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's the direction I was heading. That's really funny. Okay, so, Survivor or Amazing Race, and why? If you could be on one, mm, Amazing Race, because it seems like it's a little bit more collaborative, like teamwork getting towards a goal. Survivor is kind of like you're on your own, I think. I don't watch either of the shows very well. So okay. Survivor, Amer Amer American Ra American Journey, American Race, Great American, <laughs> whatever it's called. Okay, next question. If you had to had a choice between two superpowers, flying or invisibility, which would you choose? Invisibility. Why? why? Um, I don't know. <laughs> so people can see me? Okay. Don't want to be seen. All right. Uh, con this is a controversial question. You can only ever watch one series ever. Star Wars or MCU? Uh, I can only watch Star Wars or MCU. You got one minute. Oh, that's tough, man. I love Star Wars more because of what it, it's the nostalgia, but I think there's more to watch in Marvel. So I think I'd get I I I think I'd, I wouldn't get as bored quickly with Marvel. So probably MCU. All right. Okay. Last question. Where can people find you online? Oh man, you can find me. Probably the best place to get started is on Instagram at the Josh Arana, and uh, yeah, follow me there. Instagram. You see it right there on your screen. That's where you can find Josh. Josh, would you come back sometime and do a uh, maybe a branding and social media podcast with us sometime? Absolutely. 100%. We'd love to do that. Thanks so much for joining me today, Josh. Thank you all for watching. 
And uh, we will have, would you also click like and subscribe and all that fun stuff that helps some sort of algorithm stuff that's magic out there that I don't understand. I'm not smart enough to know. Um, but we'll catch you on the next Practical Youth Ministry Tips podcast. See ya!